Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. We will begin our webinar. I'm Rosa Lazardi, the Global Director of the Feminist Task Force and co convener of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. A warm welcome to all, wherever you may be joining us. We're thrilled to present our webinar, A Global Regime of Intellectual Property Rights and Trade, Who Will Benefit by the New Solutions for the Pandemic and the Upcoming Famine. And we're thrilled to be co-organizing this with our partners at Third World Network. This webinar is part of a series of webinars entitled Macro Solutions for Women, the People, and the Planet a series of action-oriented dialogues on the macro agendas and the current crises. We will be running this webinar series for the next two months. By way of background, the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development, founded in 2006, is an alliance of women's organizations and networks which advocate for the advancement of gender equality and women's human rights within the context of the financing for development related processes at the United Nations. The financing for development agenda, which includes issues related to trade, debt, official development assistance, domestic resource, mobilizing domestic resources, and systemic issues is part of the work that the women's working group tries to demystify for women's and feminist organizations and various audiences. Our work is to bring analysis and through advocacy begin to dismantle inequalities and promote policies and programs that advance women's economic justice. In key moments, the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development has provided analysis, advocacy, and guidance. In 2008, in the lead up to the Doha Review Conference, the second global conference on financing for development, and in the context of the financial and economic crises, those UN processes presented opportunities to make significant structural changes in the global development architecture. The Women's Working Group on Financing for Development sees this political moment to move towards advocating for a rights-based global development architecture that recognizes the central role of the care economy, social reproduction, and sexuality. In 2015, the advocacy and strategizing for the third Financing for Development Conference in Addis Ababa provided an extensive arena for alliance building, networking, and strategizing on financing for development related issues, bringing a feminist and women's rights perspective to the discussions and deliberations of the Addis Ababa Conference. And certainly now in 2020, in the context of the corona pandemic and the global uprisings in defense of racial tension, xenophobia, and sexism, there is a need for continued vigilance, interpretation, and analysis to a changing world. Our intention is to bring forth this analysis, thinking, and dialogue through these webinars and other work in the near future with all our partners, such as we are doing today with Third World Network. And we're thrilled to be able to have a great panel and wonderful moderator for you to to um, to enjoy. So without further delay, let us move on to our program. Let me pass on to my partner and co-convener, Emilia Reyes. Hi, everybody. So happy to have you here. I mean, we're starting with, we're trying a new platform today. We're actually very excited uh, to thank, firstly, uh, my team in Equidad de Genero, the amazing technical team that is helping us, which is uh, composed by uh, Ale, Cynthia, Armando, and, and Gabby, who are helping us to be in this, in this uh, cabin studio in which we will be uh, working and and uh, it's like uh, we're we're doing the shooting here and you're you should be watching us in YouTube so feel free to comment on 
on the on the section and comments on YouTube, and we will be getting those, and we will be uh, including those in your in in the in the flow of the conversation cr across the the session. So. First of all, uh, I really wanted to thank uh, our team in Equidad because we're ensuring also with a feminist ethics that we're doing a transmission, ensuring safety for, for the speakers and the panelists, and as well as also providing more privacy to you as, as viewers. So we think that this type of uh, feminist practice is also uh, more widespread as the, the time in the pandemics and the confinement uh, goes by. So thank you so much. So uh, I'm Emilia Reyes. I'm the other co-convener of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. And we are from a, a Mexican feminist organization called Equidad de Género, Ciudadanía, Trabajo y Familia. Uh, uh, gender equity, citizenship, work and family. And what we do, we have uh, two main substantive programs. One on uh, one on sexual reproductive health and rights and access to legal abortion and the other on, on uh, policies and budget for equality and sustainable development. And we are thrilled to welcome you in this series of macro solutions for, for women, people and the planet. What we want is really to to, to have a conversation about what are the macro agendas that are underlying the bigger challenges. In this series of webinars, we won't be addressing so much uh, sectorial approaches, uh, but rather what are the macro challenges that are really impacting at the local level and that no community, no nation, no region on their own can solve, but we really need to address this as a collective. So our, our exciting uh, panel for today is going to be bringing us not only the most crucial uh, discussion at this moment, on access to, to the basic elements to face the pandemic, but um, I just want to say that these are people that I really, really admire a lot. So it's it's really a luxury and a pleasure to have them. I, I could uh, this is really groupy mode today. So we're very, very happy to have them all. Um, I just wanted to to let you know also that we will be having the next webinar next in in 15 days. It will be uh, on another very relevant issue. Uh, because we're trying to gather some um, fiscal floor for all the implementation of the of the measures in the face of the of the upcoming recession and that to, to face the the current pandemic. So our next webinar will be called Taxation for Redistributive uh, Justice: Taxation Solutions for Women, the People, and the Planet. So stay with uh, with us. Uh, this this uh, following days we will be sharing all the info you need, and we are very proud as well to be co-organizing that webinar with the Tax and Gender Working Group and uh, on for the yeah the gender and tax uh, justice network and the women's working group on ffd so uh, we will be sharing information so stay tuned for that and without further ado i do i will introduce our moderator our fabulous uh barbara adams uh she's she's a rock star on her own you all know her and uh, she's the senior policy advisor for the global policy forum we're super thrilled to have her because she will help us make as well not only a moderator passing around the mic but really making the connections with our work in, at the un and the multilateral spaces so uh barbara adams welcome so much to this webinar Thank you very, very much for the welcome. And I suppose immediately I should reassure everybody that despite Amelia's introduction, you don't have to listen to me sing because that would really be very, very painful. Um, and as we've heard already, we have um, some very, um, I don't know if they're new issues, but some issues that we're really going to delve into from a collective and a feminist point of view. And I think, as everybody knows, we definitely are living in an unequal world. And if there's one thing that we will all take away, the virus has exacerbated and has exposed the inequalities and the injustices. It's also laid bare something we as feminists know. It's also laid bare the intersectionalities that entrench those inequalities. And as Amelia just said, this is at all levels and across borders. And so part of what we really want to explore today is on the one hand, the injustices 
at all levels and on the other hand how we together collectively can think out loud on how to actually challenge what we're talking about. So today's uh, session is going to be, it's got two main parts to it. One is really to get in depth on the issues, why these issues matter. And the other main part of it is, if you like, to turn ourselves into a kind of a strategy group, a strategy session, to start pulling out as we go through this, how to communicate, how to do advocacy, how to unpack these issues, because it's not obvious all the time that these are really, really injustice and feminist issues. And sometimes they may sound more like finance issues or more like legal issues. And so that's part of the task we all have for ourselves today. Um, we know that multilateralism and working across borders at the moment is very, very polarized. And I think with so many things we're involved in, we're basically caught when we try to figure out where are the best places for us to take our advocacy and at what levels and with whom. We're caught in what is a struggle between what is and what we think it should be. And the UN's Financing for Development Agenda is kind of an epitome of that tension. Because we're facing a situation where the decision making in so many areas has basically been captured by interests and deal making and is not functioning in a framework with regard to justice. So we're going to be exploring today not only solutions, not only single issue approaches, but we also need to explore that these solutions actually require changing rules, challenging institutions and changing structures. And to do that, we have three panelists with us who um, have the kind of experience, commitment and training. They're going to take us through this. Um, we have Ranja Sengupta, who is a senior researcher with Third World Network, trained as an economist, and has worked across a number of areas in terms of agriculture and trade, and is currently focusing on the global trade issues and investment policies, and has also been very active with uh, how this applies and the, with regard to women's organizing. We will also have Yok Ling, who's trained as a lawyer and who is head of a nonprofit research and advocacy group, again, Third World Network, which you might know. And she also is specializing in a variety of issues, but definitely today is in the forefront of the work with regard to public health. And Maria Maya, South, based in South Africa, who is the founder and director of the Africa Center for Biodiversity, which is a research and advocacy organization uh, tackling food sovereignty and agroecology. Each panelist, I will give uh, I don't know how you do this nicely in our current format. So I'll give each panelist a 10 minute warning. Um, and I think as we already know, um, we're communicating and engaging and interacting in the chat, as well as um, hopefully at some different stages directly in this current medium. Ranja, over to you. Um, thank you, Barbara. Um, let me also add my thanks to the Women's Working Group uh, on behalf of TWN. We are very honored to organize, uh, co-organize this uh, particular webinar uh, with you. And I'm sure my director, Yokling will also add her voice to this, um, you know, um, the, her voice of appreciation. Uh, so let me uh, not waste time and move over to, the, to, to my topic. So I'll be speaking on trade issues. And we know, you know, uh, uh, I mean, we are in the era of globalization, right? Like we know the importance of international trade and it's been touted as the big uh, big instrument for development, uh, also for developing countries. And uh, uh, in this era of globalization, increasingly we see that you know international trade has taken over a policy which should have been, uh, or which was earlier actually determined by domestic government so even our domestic policies is increasingly being you know taken over by what will happen to your trade and what does you know the us talk say about it or what does china say about how you are doing trade so we see this very this great influence of international trade even in 
even how we run our domestic economies these days. And um, in particularly standing where we are now in the middle of this COVID crisis, what I wanted to also argue and show you is that, you know, uh, constraints posed by this international trade system has actually not only determined how governments are dealing with their COVID crisis, where they are, you know, each government, how they are placed in, re in, in re with respect to this crisis, but also how they will move forward. So this global trading system, as many of you, uh, I'm sure you have followed it for a long time. And uh, so this trading system, governments were autonomously following their and shaping their own trade policies. But we increasingly see uh, with the start of the GATT and the WTO, and this was really pushed by you know, advanced countries, the US and EU really wanted this global system. They actually pushed for GATT. And so they, we had the WTO. And then we have an increasing number of bilateral, regional, plurilateral, which are issue specific uh, trade and investment agreements. So we were, we were calling them free trade agreements. Now we are calling them mega free trade agreements, like the TPP, uh, the RCEP. And so, may, so we have many agreements which are creating legally binding rules. So the difference is that they actually force our governments to commit to certain, to make certain commitments. And if they don't meet those commitments, they could get sued. Now the key approach is that, you know, free trade is great. So no country should use import duties. They should not use subsidies. They should just let the global economy flow freely and trade flow freely. So the most efficient producer, wherever, you know, whichever country it is, in whichever part of the world will supply and so on. So basically, uh, developed countries have pushed this kind of, you know, this kind of approach of free trade. But we see that they have actually protected their own economies through a different host of you know, they have used standards, technical barriers, and so on. And they have really controlled technology, which has given them a great edge. And frankly, we have seen after so many years of globalization, there is really nothing called free trade. And in, in the field of agriculture, we have seen uh, Western subsidized products because uh, EU, US, many other developed countries huge, use huge agricultural subsidies. And those products have entered developing country markets because they've been asked to eliminate import duties. They have destroyed production, livelihoods of small farmers. And many of these small farmers are women. Uh, in the industry, um, you know, increasingly countries and developing countries have been told they cannot even develop and protect infant industries. They cannot use, again, import duties. They cannot use subsidized uh, subsidies. But rich countries, when they grew, they used very high subsidies. They also used import duties. But now, when it's the turn of developing countries, they have been told they cannot use these. So, and this whole thing of global value chain, you know, corporations based in the north have gone to developing countries, exploiting their natural resources, exploiting their labor. And these countries, these poorer countries, they have all been at the bottom of the value chain. The top of it is controlled by technology, by corporations sitting in rich countries. And now when we come to COVID, so what has happened? Our governments are import dependent, both in terms of medical products. That includes medicines, medical equipments, ventilators, supporting gear like PPEs and everything. We see that there's huge global concentration. Just a few countries, US, Germany, Switzerland, China, just a few countries are the largest medical suppliers. And most of our countries are importers. So they do not have at all any control over how they deal with the crisis. And then we also expect that in the wake of this uh, COVID crisis, we will have a food crisis because, you know, a lot of production in agriculture sector elsewhere and distribution of food, these channels are getting impacted. Imports are getting impacted. And again, developing countries have been told for a long time, you cannot have import duties. You should not have agricultural subsidies. Their subsidies have been systematically attacked. And right now, when, when you have, a, say, a shortage of food or a limitations on global food trade, then developing countries are likely to suffer a lot. So, uh, so even now, when the recommendations are coming, you know, COVID-19 uh, recommendations, if you see in the WTO, what are the developed countries saying? They are still saying, do not just take down your tariffs. But if we take down our import duties, how are we developing countries? How will we become self-reliant in key critical 
areas like you know medi medicines and medical equipments how will we become more self sufficient in food and we see the need for at least if not full because i'm not advocating we shouldn't do any international trade no country can produce everything it needs but at least a certain degree of self reliance we do need to develop in critical sectors and therefore some of these instruments which had been taken away from us need to be back we need to use them <clears throat> but the interesting thing is this global trade regime doesn't just talk about industrial and agricultural goods i mean goods trade we have left it you know far behind long back because it is moving into areas uh, firstly services so services have been liberalized through the world so we have seen great push for privatization and foreign control over our key services such as health so now sitting you know in india uh, in the private hospitals many of which are partly i mean majorly foreign owned they are charging four times the usual rates for covid treatment i mean massive treatment they are asking for massive deposits and this is what we have done to service trade liberalization but uh, what i'm really concerned about also from a feminist perspective is that trade is getting into deep policy regulation areas so areas like e-commerce and areas like intellectual property rights so the trips agreement on intellectual property rights was already included under wto huge impact on access to medicines and food but i know yokling and mariam will talk about intellectual property rights in detail so i don't want to talk about it but other areas uh, a lot of plurilateral agreements have been pushed but they are always trying to multilateralize these plurilaterals at the wto so there's investment facilitation there is government procurement liberalization there is e-commerce so all these i don't have time to go into details but they basically constrain our government's powers to regulate and to regulate corporations so in e-commerce gigantic digital corporations basically want rules it's not really about trade it is that they don't want to be regulated they want to have rules that actually ensure they have no rules right so they can operate anywhere they don't have to pay taxes they cannot be told to do something and so on but i see that these you know deep policy regulatory areas are very damaging for women because women need governments i mean our governments are not always doing the best regulations we know but we would want them to have the policy space to be able to regulate for the marginalized groups for poorer sections and so on but when you are giving up this policy space you are actually it means you are not able to protect more marginalized groups women indigenous communities poor rural population workers patient groups and so on so finally um, there's also uh, investment agreements which is you know these are investment protection agreements uh, they are a thing <laughs> in themselves because what these agreements have done uh, globally more than 3500 or so uh, that once a foreign company has made an investment in your country their profits must be protected so if the government is making any change in policy which will reduce their profits they can sue the government in secret international arbitration cases not under domestic courts right it just goes to secret international arbitration cases and where these arbitration tribunals are really gray areas a lot of conflict of interest but for example if your government actually implemented a good public policy they can be sued so when governments were trying to bring in plain packaging on cigarettes to dissuade people from smoking they were sued by uh, philip morris uruguay australia were bo both sued and even now when governments are trying to take covid measures uh, they are being sued by corporations because when corporations profits go down they can sue it doesn't matter if you have a raging health crisis an environmental crisis a financial crisis so i think this the investment agreements and what the the instrument they provide is called investor state dispute settlement mechanism i mean it's quite a famous term now i'm sure many of you work on it or follow it this has been another way um, in which you know this whole trade and investment regime has been systematically used to keep developing countries from developing and their marginalized populations 
So there is what we say, you know, the north within the south and the south within the north. So poorer and more marginalized and vulnerable sections within the south, within developing countries, have lost out because they neither have the financial resources, the power, the economic, political might to kind of benefit from these agreements because these are frankly really driven and shaped and dominated by gigantic corporations. But they also uh, cannot, um, uh, they, can, they cannot also benefit. So they cannot, they do not own these processes. They cannot benefit from it, but they end up paying more than their fair share of the price. When medicine prices go up because of intellectual property rights, then poorer people pay more. Women give up treatment. I know HIV impacted couples in India, where when the prices become high, the woman gives up the treatment because the man has to continue the treatment. So there are different dimensions how our you know, more vulnerable groups are dealing with the impacts of these agreements, but they are huge. And coming to COVID, I mean, our government's policy space is already heavily constrained. Even going forward, they cannot do many things because trade rules will not allow them. And this cost is more heavily borne by women's groups and other marginalized groups. So quickly, I didn't get the warning from Barbara, but I'm not sure um, what's happening. So quickly, just let me spend a minute on what we can do. Uh, Barbara, how much time do I have? Um, OK, well, I tried to give you the warning, but technology oh. was on your side and didn't allow oh. me to communicate with you. You've OK, I'll take one minute. I'll just take one minute. minute. Yeah, one OK, minute. Uh, thanks. Uh, so basically, so what should a group like ours do? And we are so happy to work with, I mean, to, to see many of you here, really strong feminist activists. What should we do together, right? So one is trade groups. Many of us who work on trade investment uh, issues and agreements, basically we are asking for a halt to the negotiations. We are telling our governments that the times have changed. You are where you are now, and you are unable to handle such a crisis because you have given away such a lot of policy space in these trade agreements. So time to halt the negotiations, take a fundamental relook at your trade and investment policy, determine first what your domestic macro policy needs are. Your trade and investment policy should follow. It cannot precede. It can't be that you have to give such and such concession, and therefore your domestic policy will be designed accordingly. It has to be exactly the opposite. We are asking for a moratorium on the ISDS cases. Nobody should be able to sue governments using ISDS under the investment treaties for COVID measures. Uh, <coughs> women's groups also have a major role to play. Do not let this issue of you know women gender don't let, allow it to be hijacked because that's what's happening in the WTO. Many of you know, gender and trade is a huge thing. Now, everything they wanted before, they are now just saying, oh, it's all for women. It's just for women's empowerment Ranger. that we want this, this liberalization. Yeah. So do not let that uh, to ha happen. And finally, just use the progressive, positive global platforms like UN, human rights mechanisms, the FFD, the, the Beijing platform, CEDAW, etc., to review these agreements and say that these are conflicting with the with the progressive commitments that our governments have made. Thank you, Barbara. I'm sorry for. Uh, oh, don't out. be sorry. You said so much. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I think that you introduced a lot of really crucial things that we need to work out how to bring into our advocacy. Um, clearly, um, different countries are having experiences in very different ways from what's happened with the whole trade and investment regime. Um, I think you pulled out a couple of things that we need to come back to. You talked about policy space. You talked about what it is and why it matters and for whom. I think that's an area that we need to develop much more so from a feminist angle. What's policy space? Why does it matter? Um, on the one hand, I think also the global value chain conversation, because that was, you know, the good old fashioned economics used to be that the value added depended on which sectors, whether you went from primary to secondary to tertiary. And what we are seeing now is actually the value isn't captured like that. The value is captured much more by size, by control, by what you said, the key rule. It's a rule to have no rules. It's not not a rule so to speak, and we need to actually 
really penetrate how those kinds of policies and decisions are made. And I think also the multiplier effect, the way in which you explained that something that seemed to be in a separate track, that seemed to be part of multilateralism, the World Trade Organization, but running separately, has actually multiplied into so many areas, has multiplied into the issue of food sovereignty, has multiplied into health area. But unfortunately, the human rights approach has not multiplied. We're not using that framing. They've managed to overtake, bypass, maybe that's the rule, is that there are no rules. And I think it's something that we'll come back to and maybe discuss a little bit more as well, what you mentioned at the end, the way in which investors can sue states and basically claim public money that should be used for human rights and for public goods. Um, Maybe this is the right time to move to Yok Ling. You talked about uh, the suing dynamic, the legal side of it. Um, Yok Ling, over to you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And uh, I join Ranja in saying how absolutely excited and proud we are in the World Network to be uh, you know, co-hosting, co-organizing this with uh, the feminist groups, especially the working, uh, Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. I just wanted to highlight that uh, coming up, uh, you know, continuing from where Ranja left off, you already have two or three major law firms, in, so-called international law firms, basically based in the north, that have already advertised their services to foreign investors, to multinational corporations, basically, saying, we are ready to serve you. We are monitoring the measures, the laws, the programs uh, that are being uh, implemented by governments around the world to respond to the COVID-19. Uh, from public health measures to social measures to economic measures to protect people and the country. And we are ready, these law firms say, to help you sue these governments. So this is very real. In fact, the first case has already been filed, not under an investment treaty, but under a contract, which is in Peru. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, a company that has been given the private right to collect tolls on highways in Peru. Um, they are suing the uh, Peruvian government under a contract. Uh, saying that the government's decision to stop payments of toll, collection of toll payments on highways, is affecting their profits. So it's already started. So I just wanted to you know, highlight that very important point. So coming to the area of uh, intellectual property, as Ranja was explaining, you know, in the name of so-called free trade and uh, economic liberalization that's supposed to bring us all so much more happiness and joy and women, once we become part of the global supply chain, we're going to be really liberated. That mantra, I mean, I've caricatured it, but it really is what we hear at the WTO and in regional and bilateral uh, economic agreement negotiations all the time. And yet intellectual property is not about opening up. It's about monopoly. It's about closing up. It's about, uh, you know, from, from, from inventions, from, like, uh, from organisms and uh, life forms to copyright, to uh, knowledge, to books, you name it, the different types of intellectual property, uh, you know, it's about locking up. And the way this was justified to make it an international law back in the early 90s was to call it trade-related intellectual property rights. Trade-related, it's got nothing to do with trade, right? So the trade-related intellectual property rights agreement that came into force in 1995 for developed countries and for developing countries, we were given, oh, five-year grace period to get our act together. So for developing countries, it's 2000. The year 2000 was when we were supposed to implement our international obligations. And this TRIPS agreement was part of the whole package of uh, a whole group of uh, so-called trade agreements that basically was uh, the reality that Ranja just described in WTO today. And these were all launched as a big package after about 10 years of really difficult negotiations. And most of our countries in the South had no clue when it came to the intellectual property negotiations, uh, what it was all about. So what we had really in the end was, if you want access to sell, for example, to Malaysia, you want to export your palm oil you know, to the United States, to Europe, uh, then you must accept intellectual property. So this one package, take it or leave it, meant that even countries like Argentina at that time, Brazil, uh, India, uh, South Africa, some countries were aware that the intellectual property piece was very dangerous. But they had to take it because they thought they were going to get a multilateral system where they could have more markets for their products. And very importantly, they thought they were going to have a system where the United States could not flex its muscle to take unilateral trade action to punish countries when they don't like what they do. 
not because of economics, but because of more often than not because of geopolitical uh, differences. So, so for many countries in the South, the big contract, the big deal the, the, that, that, that they accepted, our governments accepted at that time was that there will be the end of unilateral economic power under the United States laws. And we know today, fast forward more than 30 years later, that joining WTO that was set up to implement all these agreements, including the one on intellectual property, did not stop the United States from actually flexing its muscle, right? So for intellectual property, 1995 is a very, very defining historic moment because before 1995 and the TRIPS agreement, there was no international obligation on any one of our countries to give intellectual property protection. And the term intellectual property right itself, which I don't like to use the word right because it is not a right. Intellectual property, whether it's a patent or a trademark or a copyright, yeah, as an example, these are privileges given by the state right, to reward those who have creativity, invention that is of benefit to society. And so you want to reward those people who invent and create by giving them a temporary exclusivity. It was not supposed to be a monopoly, a temporary exclusivity so that you can get back your investment and to be rewarded. But eventually this thing goes back to the public, especially if it comes to medicines or food or essential products. Yeah? So in many countries before 1995 and TRIPS, they, you have a right, talking about policy space, to choose not to allow patents on medicines, not allow patents on seeds or any form of intellectual property on these crucial public goods, yeah? This is a human right, we talk about health, for example. And even if you decide to actually give medicines that are new, a new molecule, a new chemical compound that, uh, you know, is going to be uh, very, very important in curing a disease, even if you decide that you want to allow a monopoly in your country for a limited period, you choose whether it's five years or seven years or 10 years. So there was really, a lot of it is national policy space. And what is important to remember, polio is one of those really, really, uh, you know, uh, drastic diseases that has been eradicated almost here. Yeah? We have eradicated, at least officially in medical terms, polio was eradicated because the two scientists who actually developed the polio vaccines said they refused. They were asked to patent and they said, you cannot, we, they did not want to patent. And Salk was one of the uh, vaccine uh, uh, in, inventors. He said, patent? A polio vaccine, can you patent the sun? That is a quote, can you patent the sun? And so if we had a patent over polio vaccines decades ago in the 60s, early 60s, late 50s, we would not see the eradication of polio today, right? So it is a, so I wanted to just say this, say that what the COVID-19 has shown us is nothing new, all right? For the last 20, 30 years, ever since the TRIPS agreement had gone into implementation, one of the first fights was about how the prices of medicines which were up, could be arbitrarily set by those companies that hold patents over medicines was really destroying health. HIV AIDS in the late 1990s when the cure was found and the cure, a treatment, right? right? You don't cure, there is no cure. It's a treatment that, that really pushes back the, 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 the virus. The, the first HIV medicine was not a new invention. It was an existing drug that was used for other diseases. And doctors who were treating HIV patients in the United States especially, noticed that those who were treated with the same, it's called AZD, were actually responding really well on the HIV front as well. So this was an observation, it was a discovery, and discoveries are not patentable. You don't exert a patent over private, private, and turn it into private property. So they alerted the companies. So just as you alert com uh, drug companies to side effects, you also alert them to these kind of positive uh, new or second users of existing drugs. So it was a discovery. And the company concerned slapped a 20 year patent on it and it became so expensive, people were dying across, right? From the United States to South Africa where the movement of access to medicines was triggered because of that. And when South Africa tried to use, they didn't attack the patent, they just wanted to use the competition law to say that if a patent is abused to create a monopoly that kills people, then the competition authority, right, of the South African gov uh, uh, government can do something. And just by taking that step, about 40 multinational drug companies threatened to sue the government of South Africa. So you had this extreme explosion. Today, we have a very vibrant access to medicines movement around the world on hepatitis C, on cancer drugs. And the center of our fight is really about the monopolies created by intellectual property. And what is this thing called patent? You know, it's, 
it's about an invention. Remember I said an invention to be recognized, to be given a monopoly, not all inventions qualify. An invention must be new. It must have novelty. It hasn't been seen around before. It doesn't exist before. It is actually involving an inventive step. So if I just make a little bit of a change to an existing medicine, little, little changes, a lot of patents are given in many, many countries today on many little, very minor little changes. There are very few new molecules that have been discovered. So minor changes, second or uh, you know, multiple uses of existing drugs. I change something from 20 milligrams and I say a 40 milligram uh, you know, dose is uh, more effective and you can also get new patents if your law allows it. If I turn something from a syrup to a tablet, if I take two, two tablets and then combine it to one, so I take one rather than two, which is very important for compliance for many diseases that you have to take for your lifetime, you know, medicines, all these in some countries, in many countries actually, are allowed to get a patent. Now, what is new, what is inventive step, is up to a country to decide in its national law and standards. And this is very important for us to remember because a big battlefield for the right to health and the right to have access to affordable medicines is to make sure your national patent law, especially as it applies uh, to, to medicines, diagnostics, vaccines, you know, uh, will be so strict that you really only reward yeah, that uh, a product that is new and really involves inventive step. So tinkering around the little bits and pieces here should not be given patents. So countries like Argentina in the last years and others like Ecuador, even Indonesia and India in its original patent law that they had to uh, amend to comply with the TRIPS agreement, they put all these safeguards, but not enough. <clears throat> these are our rights to have those safeguards and flexibilities as we call them. And we actually have not used enough of that. So what we have seen in the last 30 years is a huge increase in prices. And we find that uh, about 2 billion people lack access to the most basic essential medicines. We're not talking about cancer drugs or, fat, you know, or, or those very difficult diseases or rare diseases. We're talking about just essential basic medicines. More than 2 billion people lack enough access. 15% of the world's population is consuming over 90% of the world's pharmaceuticals. So the rich are consuming too much right, or things that are just a little bit of change and paying a lot more for what they think are new medicines. We have overconsumption of antibiotics, uh, and there you lead to, you know, antibiotic resistance, whereas you have a lot of poor people who can't even get access to the most basic medicines, let alone things like cancer drugs. So when we fast forward to uh, where we are today with COVID, so much of the fight we saw, all of us saw how the, the uh, even entire aeroplanes uh, from China going to Europe or Canada were intercepted so that masks, N95 marks was in shortage, and you had rich countries, they never admitted it, you know, uh, of course, but there were evidence to show that you had certain countries intercepting entire loads of masks because they wanted. So it's a great, it's a free for all. Multilateralism has not seen, it's been eroded over the years, but it has not seen, we have not seen such bare faced selfishness of the elites in those countries. Governments like the Trump administration have behaved very shamefully. So we find that if this is the case with masks, can you imagine what happens when you have a vaccine? Can you imagine what's going to happen when you have, um, uh, uh, you know, medicines that cure, right? So already we see the scramble. Lots of public money from the US and Europe are being pumped into a few drugs, right? There are three, there are two categories. The vaccines that will, if it works, prevent us from getting the disease. There's a race on, but we're not close there. We're not anywhere near close to a vaccine. It's not so easy to make a vaccine and the virus may be mutating already. The class of drugs that we see, right, whether AstraZeneca is going to sell the first, already promised to sell the first few hundred million doses to a group of European countries. Uh, Trump had gone in and sort of made sure that he got the hydroxychloroquine, you know, and first we see the access within the North were also unequal. The access for the South is almost non-existent, right? Least developed countries do not have an obligation under the TRIPS agreement to give patents to, to actually implement most of the TRIPS agreement. And they certainly have an extension to it to for another couple of decades. They don't even have to give any patents for medicines. And yet in those countries, they are not aware, and many of the least developed countries have actually passed patent laws. Yeah. So you see what the, the two drugs I want to quickly talk about. One is Remdesivir, which is a Gilead Sciences drug, which is an old drug, okay? It's a, not a new drug. This drug was, uh, this molecule has been around for a while. They tried to develop it for clinical trials. Gilead Sciences is a big American company. For Ebola, it did not work. They tried it for a couple of other diseases, antivirals, did not work. And so when we have this new uh, COVID, uh, this new uh, uh, coronavirus, which causes COVID-19, so everybody's just taking whatever we have, which are antivirals, and trying it. 
So this remdesivir severe, actually no country had actually approved it. So the United States has actually now given it uh, approval for emergency use for COVID. Then very quickly, Japan followed and one other country followed. And, but Gilead already has patents in a number of countries, but in most countries, they have not, not any patents uh, applied even. And now they're moving in and they're applying for it. Okay, yep. and very quickly, yes. I will stop. So this is an example. Another one today, there's been a steroid which has also been announced that actually works when you use this dexamethasone for very advanced cases of those patients who are under ventilator or who need oxygen. They are very, these are very sick COVID patients. Okay. Most of them will die. And they found this old drug from the sixties, no patents, right? Reasonable price actually can work with serious cases. So we need to figure out what happens, right? Right now, there are fights over patents. Uh, China and France says it should be public good if there's a vaccine. So what can we do as civil society? We have already had a lot of uh, activism all across the world. We have asked to, there be no patents, there be suspension of intellectual property claims because these companies are spending more money on marketing and paying their CEOs than they are actually developing drugs for those who need it. So there's a very skewed way of intellectual property actually being abused. And so we have to roll back. In fact, some of us were already talking before the pandemic that maybe it is time really now for us to say there should be no patents allowed on any medical products. Push back, push back, push back. So I'll stop there and we can have a discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think a couple of, of course, when you mentioned the way in which discoveries um, have been turned into monopolies, as it were, and renamed as inventions and claimed ownership. I almost wanted to make analogies with colonialization. Um, and I wonder whether we can explore some of what's happened there. The way in which so much of the protection of various corporate interests has come through the trade related, the TRIPS dynamic, I think we also need to take a closer look at how in fact the trade space has hijacked multilateralism and start thinking of our own advocacy strategies with regard to it. Um, I think Gia, someone made a comment in the chat box about the importance of thinking outside the box. I think we have to think outside the boxes that have been created for us by others and start putting some of our values, human rights, uh, public goods, health, education back in the centre. Uh, and I think your comments at the end actually were going very much in that kind of direction. There are a couple of initiatives around, like the one from Costa Rica. Um, it would be interesting maybe if we have time to explore that a little bit further. Marianne, it would be uh, wonderful to hear from you discussing this same problematic to topic, I think applied more explicitly now to the importance of the right to food and food sovereignty. Thank you very much, Barbara. And I would like to thank um, the hosts uh, for inviting me to participate in this webinar and particularly I want to say thank you to the Third World Network. We have a very long history and relationship and we will be 17 years this September in TWN, uh, strongly supported by the late Martin Kaur. Uh, I think his instrument was instrumental in supporting us and um, I just want to remember him today and we miss him and we really would have done with his guidance and we hope that we are making him proud. So I would like to um, just say that I've been given a big topic to cover and um, our experience has been principally in regard to uh, intellectual property rights over plant genetic resources uh, in food and agriculture. Uh, and our work in regard to objecting to and uh, challenging mergers and acquisitions in the uh, seed and agrochemical sector. So I will try to um, provide some context for the role that intellectual property rights have played 
uh, in regard to a number of uh, crises that we find ourselves in that has contributed to shocks over a period of time, not only in regard to the current pandemic. And the first thing I want to say is that when we think about intellectual property rights in the context of our food system, uh, we're looking at a number of such rights. And these include plant variety protection that um, is provided for in the TRIPS agreement, including patents on uh, genetic constructs, patents on proprietary technologies, uh, and these apply to not only genetic engineering and food and agriculture, but also to conventional breeding, and the corpus call this advanced breeding technologies. Uh, patents on uh, active ingredients, processes, and so on. And so we argue that this bundle of intellectual property rights uh, are part of what we call it, the architecture that holds up uh, and reinforces industrial agriculture. And that this has given, uh, has contributed to uh, the depletion of genetic resources, biodiversity and ecosystems collapse uh, in, across the world. And we already have a, a lot of discussion and discourses around uh, zoonotic spillover effects as a result of industrial agriculture and deforestation. Then the, 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 pet, the, the model is the same in industrial agriculture as it is as outlined by Yokling and Raj uh, in, the, in, the, in their discussions around corporate concentration, uh, dominance in the food, food and agriculture sector as a result of the technological lock-ins. So I will unpack these issues. And then we are very concerned principally, but not exclusively, but we are concerned about small producers, particularly smallholder farmers, and the impacts of intellectual property rights uh, on not only farmers' rights, but on farmers' seed and food systems. And the linkages uh, with the criminalization of farmers' rights and farmer seed systems and violation of human rights. Uh, and then also I want to say that also concerns about the failings of uh, intellectual uh, international agreements, uh, particularly uh, the Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, the implementation there has been non-existent to protect farmers' rights. Under the CBD, uh, we are struggling to get a space and a voice just exclusively for smallholder producers uh, as, an, as, a, as a separate sector from indigenous people and local communities in regard to plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. And then they, we're now looking at shocks and what is emerging now. So just quickly to say that <clears throat> if you look at uh, UPOV 91, for example, uh, this is a, a, a global model architecture of extremely strong intellectual property rights. And these provide very strong rights for breeders. And this has a direct impact on the extent to which Several, several multinational companies, seed companies who are also agrochemical companies and have their power entrenched in the, in the seed, food, agrochemical sector, but also the extent to which it entrenches and supports monoculture, industrial crop uh, production systems. And at the heart of it, it's based on the commodification of nature and knowledge. But also what Jokling was saying about the privileging, the bias of one set of knowledge systems over another. And so that's linked also with the technological lock-in. And this has caused uh, not only loss of agricultural biodiversity, but other uh, you know, other uh, 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 impacts on ecosystems related to uh, biodiversity loss and has is threatening the Earth's life support systems. And it's extremely evident to us in this moment. 
And we see now a very, very strong push in Africa at the national levels, even for least developed countries who have flexibilities under the TRIPS agreement in terms of the extension uh, to put a very, very strong and draconian UPOF style 91 uh, plant variety protection uh, uh, laws in place. For example, a country like Zimbabwe. Uh, also, a uh, very strong push through regional economic communities uh, to harmonize plant variety protection legislation to enable the seamless trade across the region of corporate uh, protected seed. And then we see the Continental Free Trade Areas Agreement also will start negotiations for an intellectual property uh, rights regime. And uppermost in their minds is to institutionalize UPOF 91 in a new protocol. Now, there's, as I said, a direct link with IPR regimes, particularly over plant genetic resources for food and agriculture and associated traditional knowledge, uh, and patents on genetic constructs, patents on um, uh, processes, uh, because these not only incentivizes uh, these, uh, these um, uh, corporations, but as Jokling was saying, it entrenches corporate concentration and it creates oligopolies in the seed and agrochemical sectors. And this, we're not sucking from our thumbs. This has already happened. We know that the merger between Dow and Dupont, Chem China and Syngenta, Bay and Monsanto has entrenched the power of a handful of multinational companies who control uh, seed, control agrochemicals and control the technology upon which these are produced. And as we see that the other side of it is that it's created a great dependence by commercial farmers and the food system on these seeds, these technologies, and these agricultural chemicals. And so the argument is that these corporations are too big to fail. And in this pandemic, they have stood in line first to receive bailouts. And so I won't go into the bailout discussions and structural adjustment too, as our go governments have taken huge loans that they will never be able to pay in the next 100 years and what the structural adjustment will mean for us and more liberalization in the, in the coming years. So going back to technological lock-ins and squeezing of humanity, and what we see is that the global, uh, the control by the corporates of our global productive and food systems have placed us all on a very dangerous, narrow corporate control technological path. We are now entering the era of gene editing of our food, releasing gene drive organisms in, it's, it, into, the, into the open environment. Uh, it's the first time they're genetically engineering wildlife to be extinct. Extinct, they, they, they're on a, on a path towards extinction of species. We are on a path towards more diversity. They control research and development. Gates Foundation is one of the primary uh, uh, um, uh, funders of the CGIAR systems. They dictate what research will reach in, research and development will underpin uh, technologies going forward, the kind of seeds that will come into onto the market. They control what innovation means. This means they control what farmers will plant. What food we are eating, what food we are eating, what chemicals can be used, what kind of technologies. And this in this system, we have no choice. It's an extremely draconian system where our rights have been completely stripped without us even noticing. And this has, you know, in, in many ways entrenched this highly processed, standardized. Uh, input intensive sta staple crop varieties to the detriment of uh, traditional varieties and populations of seed under the control of farmers for 10,000 years. 
Um, and it's resulted in loss of nutrients, loss of agricultural biodiversity. And then now we're entering a phase, and many of you know much more about this, the digitalization of agriculture and the role that uh, agricultural machinery will play in the sector, further technological lock-ins and squeezing us. Then we move to the issue of farmers' rights. And going back to UPOP 91, because this is an area that we know well, this is an area we work in also with Sangeeta from TWN. Um, they've, they've taught us so much about um, <clears throat> uh, these issues in the last 10 years. We work together and we see that um, uh, for the international treaty has been around for 15 years. There have been absolutely no good examples in the world where there's been good implementation of farmers' rights, farmer seed systems. In fact, we've seen the criminalization of all age old practices of seed exchange uh, between farmers, uh, seed, sa uh, seed sales. We see the de-skilling of farmers. Farmers are now just passive consumers and price takers. APRA BES is an, uh, a, a group of uh, 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 lawyers and activists who, 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 who monitor what's happening at the UPOV WIPO level. They've done a human uh, rights assessment of UPOV and they point to a direct, direct causal link between the um, uh, uh, loss on the part of farmers of, the, of access to seed and the undermining of their right to food. And so I will argue that internationally, um, there's been little to no progress, including nationally and regionally, to implement farmers' rights and uh, to gain recognition and support, public support for farmer seed systems. And I want to come to challenges and the way forward, because what I've described is not new to many of you. We all have done this analysis. We know all this. I want to say that this pandemic is not the only shock that we in Africa have have been subjected to. There's been shocks related to industrial agriculture that has caused climate change. This is the cyclones that hit us in last year. We have eight countries in East Africa have been knocked with locust infestation as a result of uh, these countries uh, experiencing much warmer weather and then the locusts swarmed when they had heavy rainfall. Uh, we have Ebola, which is also a pandemic linked to zoonotic spillover effects. And then we have COVID. But I also want to say that, uh, you know, shocks, you know, we, it depends on how we're going to define shocks. And I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but I want to say that um, I feel like um, we have, in a way, compartmentalized farmer struggles in bits and pieces. So we've been saying, okay, uh, we need to look at um, biodiversity loss under the CBD and uh, access and benefit sharing in another agreement, and then DSI, digital sequence information under the treaty, then farmer's rights under the treaty. And you can't compartmentalize the bundle of rights uh, and um, the framework within which farmers operate. And I want to argue that we need we need to look at the look at the issues more holistically in a bundle of rights, more in the way that uh, the United Declar United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and other people in rural areas have tried to do. Because um, you know, we know that there's been the usual, linkages between seeds, crops, water, biodiversity, land. But I think that shocks have to be firstly defined beyond natural disasters. They can't be only about natural disasters, climate change emergencies. I want to say that if you look at the suicides in India, that shocks are also those that come from the markets, market shocks. I would say that every time there's speculation in commodities and 
Small farmers are impacted because the price of ginger suddenly drops. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a shock for farmers. And they need to be protected against these shocks. They need to be protected against technological lock-ins. How can we abide by the fact that farmers commit suicide in India and many countries in the world? Because they are locked in and that, you know, the suicides in India it kind of highlights the, it's like the, the, the most extreme example of how dehumanizing industrial agriculture has been. So I think we need to unpack and we need to think about what we are doing and what, what, is, what does this moment represent to us and how are we going to move forward? And I want to argue that when these shocks happen and suicides happen, there's a tremendous knock-on effect for the whole community and society and particularly for women in those societies. So the corporate response to the pandemic has really been keep trade open. Uh, the 2007 aid food crisis was blamed on trade restrictions rather than economic collapse and hypercapitalism. Let's give food aid and that any stimulus package must have food and land as its central pillars where a lot of corporate, the corporate push is gaining a lot of momentum. So some of the emerging issues so that I can finish for us is clearly our governments were in a total disarray, including and especially the governments in the North. Many people were shocked to see what, you know, the poor response by governments in the North. They're supposed to have the most industrialized, best health, health systems, knowledge, and people were totally shocked by, by what they were seeing in the UK and the US. Uh, people are hungry for change. We saw, we know that we can have a discussion about the Black Lives uh, uh, Matter campaigns around the world. Very, very important. For us, we did some work um, on, we tried, we took back from UPOF and uh, WIPO, they tried to claim the 26th of April as World, World Intellectual Property Rights Day. We claimed it back as social movements across the world. We were locked down, but we were not shut down. 348 civil society organizations from 46 countries condemned this, and they said, we are taking back our seat. So the people are hungry. People know what's happening. They see what's going on. But there's a, there's a lot of chances now to push for localization of our food systems as we see the global supply chains being disrupted and uh, we see the, 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 the lack of resiliency in the current food systems. How are we going to take advantage of this? How are we going to, you know, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food has a very strong trade background. The trade issues, the convergences between the movements are really important. How are we going to reduce our dependency of food imports, particularly imported agricultural inputs, uh, seeds, agricultural chemicals, and how are we going to support domestic economies that first and foremost must meet the essential needs of all our people. We know that we must move towards sovereign systemic solutions, but we're also in it together. Uh, we in a global society, we have a common future. We must work out a global, we must work out global solutions to combat a, glo a widespread global ecological collapse, an economic collapse and a global health crisis. And we know that we need, for systemic solutions to really take root, we need to, we need a clear, clean break from cur current systems dominated by you know, these, these systems are really embedded in Western knowledge systems, uh, tools and technologies. But there are other knowledge systems, particularly to be found in the, in the, in the, in the South. Uh, and these need to be resuscitated. Yes. So I want to end and say that we know that um, we, there's been a convergence across our movements. Uh, and so... I think we are leave it there and have some discussion, but I want to say that there's you know a lot of significance in the connections, a lot of significance in the convergence, uh, and that we have to uh, think out of the box 
and use this time, which could be a time of respite for us, to reorganize ourselves, reconstruct ourselves, just as the corporations are doing. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry if I took too much time. Mariam, thank you very much. Um, not only for the detail and the understanding of what's happening uh, in agriculture, in food, in the right to food, but also the way I think that you brought it and transitioned it really, really well to what's happening in all areas, to rethinking about what shocks are. They're not one-off things that you throw a bit of money at and then keep moving. And also, um, frankly, the challenge that you gave to us at the end, which is really where we are now, about how we have to actually think of how we're working and what our strategies are and how we combine where we're rooted with our constituencies where we work with actually confronting what is a complete systemic failure for human beings. Um, I think that, uh, I don't think we've got enough time, I'm looking, um, to, to spend a lot of time sort of really analyzing the failings of different international agreements. We've worked in different ways um, to advance rights, but we're also facing a situation which all three of you have made very clear that there are agreements that are being made across borders in different policy spaces that are frankly just putting aside the gains that we've made in rights. They are based, and in lots of cases, if they're actually pursued, as in some of these investment agreements, they actually become a source for suing using taxpayer money. Um, and uh, in lots of cases, they aren't just ignored. They actually cost a lot of money um, and can't be implemented. I got a few questions I wanted to ask ask our panelists from what we've been doing to talking about today. But before I do that, I'm checking in the chat box because um, yeah, a couple, yeah, some, I think one of the things that maybe we can also um, have some more comments if there are questions in the chat box, but also uh, maybe from the panelists as well, and what Marianne was saying very clearly at the end, that recognizing the moment we are in, but not seeing it as all caused by the virus, because we know it's not true. It's this challenge of it being systemic. And systemic change is incredibly difficult to work on and to campaign around. Uh, and I wonder whether, um, Ranja Yokling, Marianne, you have any particular recommendations or suggestions that you see as a mobilizing and advocacy that we can bring together in this situation? If there's one thing that we've learned from this virus, people are understanding this is systemic failure. Right? Um, where before quite often a lot of the reactions were by sector, by issue, by different constituency in different ways. Uh, and Ranja mentioned at the beginning uh, in the presentation, or rather towards the end, the ISDS, the investor state dispute, the power of investors and the power of corporations, which has come through all. Um, it, uh, last year, I think it was the human rights experts, seven of them or more of them, had collectively signed a letter that basically said the existence of the investor state dispute settlement mechanism needed to be it needed to be abolished it wasn't a matter of making it uh, cleaning it up and there's a lot of uh, data from unctad that shows how many billions of money public money are caught up around the world with investors suing different governments according to their legislation related to environment related to women's rights related to employment which they are saying is basically violating the agreements they had as investors, okay? So I wonder whether we could start identifying, do you think there are some particular places where we 
bring our collective analysis and where we could actually get more impact, if that's the right word, for the advocacy that we're doing on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think we also really need to talk about the messages. Because, you know, we're here talking, we're very knowledgeable from an economics and a legal point of view. But I think if you went out and said to somebody, blah, 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 intellectual property rights, why is that relevant for me? So I think we've also got some messaging, we've got some um, communication strategies we need to explore as well. So can I ask, can I give you only one minute each to give me the way you would go about this? Um, more for a provocation, we're not going to hold you to it. Um, Ranj is smiling, I'll start with you. Um, one minute, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you are very right. I think we will have crisis after crisis after crisis because it is a failure of the system. And uh, the, the webinar series of the WWG actually clearly shows how one after the other, this whole global financial macroeconomic system is simply not working because it is based on, you know, uh, advancing rights of a few very powerful economic uh, corporations backed by their governments. So what I would say for me, I think maybe the for for good solutions, we generally don't go to the trade fora <laughs> because we don't <laughs> really get the good solutions there. They are the bad fora, right? So because they are based on hard uh, commercial, really cutthroat negotiations. And over years, in spite of developing countries showing some might, uh, it hasn't changed. My bet would still be the UN system, but I know, Barbara, you would have a lot to say about that. But I think um, given that some of our progressive uh, spaces, human rights spaces, even FFD and some <laughs> other spaces, we could, and, and UNCTAD has been doing good work. So, I mean, I would still say uh, somewhere under the UN umbrella, if we could organize better. And I think Tete had a question whether we are, we come up with the progressive proposals ourselves or governments. I think a, a challenge, we always face a challenge with the governments because the bureaucrats we work with change. Somebody who had progressive views would move. And how do we then work with new governments? Governments change all the time. I think we do have to find our champions in the government. And I think the crisis and the recognition more will come, maybe gives us the opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, I saw Tete's question. I'm glad you picked it up. Joaquin? Yeah, I I think that uh, that's a, you know, we <clears throat> we are talking about the next, I don't know how long it's going to be, but certainly for the rest of this year, maybe next year, maybe three to four years, we are not going to be able to move around and do the kind of advocacy we did traditionally. So the thinking out of the box is also the way we operate in the new normal, yeah? <clears throat> so I think there is a lot of work to do at the national level. We always stress that right so the two things i would say i think when we always do a mapping as civil society activists about the good the bad the evil and the neutral right we need to do the same for the un because the un is a contested space because of the same privatization state capture we saw it has happened at the international level it's no longer about the state doing its role i mean it's very clear public policy space we fight for it not just for politicians we fight for it for peoples right and, and so the injustice and all that has been thrown up is our opportunity. I don't think you can go anywhere in the world today and uh, not have people talk about systemic failures, uh, about deep inequalities. Today, we see, I see a lot of hope in health ministries. It was very hard to get health ministries to think about, you know, gene sequences, uh, benefit sharing, because they wanted to share everything because it's public health. Now they're realizing the scramble to see the richest, most powerful are going to pump the money to do the, get the drugs. They're going to pump to their companies. We have been paying high prices, not just for medicines. We have paid an industrial price. Our generic industry production capacity, our capacity to even make masks. What's so difficult about masks? There are more than 400 patents on the 3M, this company, American companies, and 95 masks. What the hell? You know, just the design, the valve, the shape. Those are just we, we got to say no to all that. Build up, link to what John just said at the beginning, we're going to build up our capacity to build 
sustainable industries where we're going to create employment and we are going to put women really on an equal if not better footing and i think that's the 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 i don't think we're short of imagination it's about the space and i think that we have to fight the national level and we will have a lot more allies we have to cut those silos down we talked about it but i think we can you will find health ministries are going to champion industrial production of medical products yeah r&d i mean people are doing 3d printing little small groups are doing 3d printing of shields okay we can do it so i'll say fight there go to the big spaces like wto and stop them from doing virtual negotiations we we, we have to yep. do that yeah. yeah so we've got two 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 prong right one is to really work for a moratorium or a ceasing of the current practices of the way in which negotiations and decisions are made at the same time that we identify other spaces and you're emphasizing i think not only national country level but also that it has to be more much more focused on people serving the people not finding a way of being stronger as a state to go and negotiate with another state in an international arena but i'm i'm and, and i want my really to talk that. about gates gates foundation somebody yeah. asked about gates foundation the most dangerous for me entity to think about in health and in agriculture is gates so mariam is your baby now <laughs> <laughs> yes Brooklyn is very evil, you know. <laughs> In a good way, you know. She knows I love her. Uh, the issue is that uh, just before you push gates onto me, uh, I, I mean, I, I want to say that uh, I, I agree with your claim, but I, you know, I, I think that we we must continue our resistance at all levels uh, because we. You know what we may gain on the swings we'll lose on the roundabout. So I think that there there is a great convergence that's happening nationally in all our countries across the movements. People are available. People are doing a forensic analysis. Uh, we are in a way in unprecedented moments. Say in South Africa, for example, uh, they were able to get together three hundred organisations across all sectors. Uh, in, uh, that has something to do with food. So I think that we need there's something to, uh, around the convergence of our issues, our forensic understanding of what's happening. We need to understand things well. Uh, what's changing? A lot is changing. What do these changes mean? Uh, some folk, some educated guesses about um, short to long uh, long term implications of all of this. Uh, and to position our struggles in a very strategic, smart way. Uh, I think that um, our governments are really uh, in disarray. Uh, they they are quite weak. I think they are vulnerable in many respects, and this is a danger uh, because we don't have their phone numbers. I, I think webinars are great, but while we're talking to each other, uh, they're brokering a lot of deals. And, you know, in the middle of this crisis, the U.S.-Kenya trade deal is going ahead. Mm. Uh, they want to com commercialize GM cassava. Uh, they are pushing all kinds of things. So I think we have to stave off a lot of the evil. And so I think it's just a multiple, multiple things we can do. And I, I think that we all understand we need to move towards new systems and it, these are systemic issues, but it's going to take a long time. And that's why I wanted to end this, um, you know, to say that everything counts. I mean, the, the, the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations, protests, these are not, didn't happen just from today. They happen because a million things have happened in the past. People have been protesting, they've been doing things. We have to do things. And that we have to understand that we, uh, we, 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 we're in a pivotal moment and we will shape the trajectory of the future and think carefully about our actions and what that is. There is no prescriptions. There's a million things that all of us have to do in the right way. That's all I can say. And we know what that right, right way is. And so I want to say that, um, uh, you know, just ending with this quote, that um, change happens beyond a lifetime, but uh, we do, you know, if we say in the past that we were 
and we're waiting awkwardly towards some destiny. We today, in this moment, I think there, there is the synergy, there's a realignment, there's an alignment as I think we dance together across time and space in our common lockdowns towards a common future. And I know it sounds a little um, out there, but that's the best way I, I can digest this. And on Gates, you know, I think that Gates is one player. He's a rich man. He's pivotal in regard to uh, entrenching corporate power. Uh, he uh, is funding uh, GM vaccines, GM technologies, gene drives. He's one player. And we must look at the architecture. The whole architecture is important. All the players in the architecture is important, not only Gates. And if we only target Gates, we will lose our focus. He's one player, he's a philanthrocapitalist, um, and he's complicit in many of, um, uh, you know, in many of uh, the research agendas of, uh, of our governments. Uh, he's he shifted uh, a lot of, um, I think, uh, you, you know, he's shifted the discourse on the continent through uh, the, the, his support of Agri. I mean, there's a lot of damage caused. But, you know, do, do we need, I mean, there's the World Bank, there's the IMF, there's a whole range of, my dog wants to go out and stretch it. Uh, there's a whole range of players. I don't want us to be to be woodwing. I mean, I think he's one player and is important, but I think I wouldn't want us to go down the Gates rabbit hole. Let me say that. Uh, but we, I, I think we need to keep our we have to keep our we have to keep our perspective, Yokling. Uh, yeah. And the perspective is beyond one philanthropic capitalist. So yeah. So that's how I, I, I think yeah. we'll we'll agree that he's a symbol that we're very concerned about, even if he's sometimes the almost the only or the largest symbol. Um, I want to make a, a a suggestion to the organisers. I know we're out of time, or more or less out of time, and I have checked the chat box. Please draw my attention if I've missed something that we should address. But one of the things I think that's going on here that we need to, to think about in better language than I'm about to use, um, we, we, we're really, we've analysed really well and shown the failure of the way decision making at all kinds of levels has been captured or is being used or is not representing the key issues that we're, uh, we're working for. Um, and we know that from a lot of us monitoring very closely negotiations, that in a lot of situations, governments or states don't always argue for the best position because they don't think they can get it. And they're often approaching this to get the best deal they can get, so to speak. And that does not get us to the kind of systemic issues that we're talking about. I think we need to do a little bit more work on what we mean by policy space. And yeah. policy space, I don't think, is only at the national level. Um, the, if we look at the various different multilateral fora and compare them, there's a real hierarchy there. Um, in terms of whether it's the WTO, some of the investment agreements, the IMF, the World Bank, etc. And there are some areas that don't have the policy activizing space. Okay. And I think we need to also look and see how we bring that into our own strategies so that we work not only in one area advancing, but have much stronger strategies also for dealing with the obstacles of advancing what we're committed to in various different ways. The other thing I think is really, really tricky, and this is where I would ask the organizers to um, maybe develop another conversation around this. I think we would all agree that human rights is crucial that investment, uh, sorry, environmental treaties and so on are crucial. Um, 
but I think that most of us feel up until recently that there's been a lot of lack of enthusiasm, trust in terms of the gains that are coming through the public sector. And that is perhaps also what has led people to people like Gates, what has led to philanthropy, what is talking about this so-called multi-stakeholder engagements and all the rest of it. I really think we need a session on how we work with and approach the state. And we don't just do this north, south, the state. We know Jocelyn gives us examples all the time, excellent examples, and you just did with regard to health, of the differentiation also within the public sector. And perhaps we need to also really deepen our, share our experiences and develop some kind of strategies of how we actually work to advance the public sector, because for just about everything we're talking about, if we don't have a, a vibrant, long-term focused public sector, we don't have so much of what we're talking about. We are never gonna be able to rely on the market to prove, deal with the long-term investment needed in things like climate change, to make sure that there is the investment, that, that there is education for all, that there are sufficient health equipment available in the inventory, not just that you produce it when you hit a crisis, the so-called Amazon production model, etc. This is the public sector side of it. So I think we we would need to to um, to go much further from that point of view. Um, we haven't uh, developed any crazy um, one-liners. Stop this. Do that. If anybody is still inclined to put those in the chat box, please do. Um, and I think at this stage, I would like to thank all of us and hand the e-mic or whatever it is back to Amelia or Rosa. We will be welcoming you all in our next webinar in uh, in a fortnight. Thank you so much. Uh, we promised a night uh, for groupies, and we achieved it. So thank you very much. And uh, I just we, we cannot sum up whatever has been said here, but it has been a real pleasure. And you are leaving us a lot of tasks and uh, work to do. And we hope that we will keep on doing it collectively. As you highlighted, so many points of entry for our advocacy and work. And we, as the Women's Working Group, are trying to come up with a with a plan of campaigns of campaigns. So we will get back to you on that once we are having it. But. Thank you so much for helping us mapping precisely the type of structural work that is needed nowadays. So thank you. And big, big kisses and big hugs with all the love and admiration from Mexico City to all of you. And thank you to the team in Equidad. I also wanted to thank Denise who's taking notes in the first uh, webinar. So thank you as well for the technical team. Thank you yes, to our marvelous speakers. Yeah. I agree, Barbara, and, uh, that we just started the dialogue but we need now the action part. So stay tuned because we hope to be able to follow up with that part. And uh, yes. July 1st, 9 a.m., gender and tax. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Well, you know, it's very late for me. It's time for my glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Love you all, ladies. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you to the technical team. And uh, Simon, say hello. Hey. 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 Hi. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you're not just. Uh, uh, I hope you're not disappointed about the gates thing. I mean, we can talk about gates, but I just want to. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Don't worry. No further. Further. Yeah, no, we'll 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 get him. <laughs> have a full webinar on that. I know because uh, it's no, so, that's you know. what that's what Mariam is angling for a, a dedicated webinar I, because I know the work she's tracking on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll follow up. Now that we're Come on, I want to on Gates. You can <laughs> just give me five five seconds on Gates. Man, I'm so much. <laughs> you know, the main thing for me is not just the money Gates puts in; it's the money he takes from the public purse. Yes, because that's right. a lot of the agreements that Gates has, he goes to different governments and signs memorandum of agreement with them, like in Norway, like in Germany. And that then becomes part of the same investment. 
and we don't forget we really need to analyze how yes. public money is being used in a whole variety of ways and all so, his money for his foundation came from his monopoly on microsoft way okay don't forget <laughs> that that's where the money came from well, from monopoly also, the investment was also in monsanto we could do this for quite a long time exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes this is this is called a preview okay. <laughs> another session <laughs> bye bye, bye, -bye. <laughs> thank you thank you all. Thank bye. 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 Thank bye bye thank you so long bye, bye. bye.